Formula One has recently experienced a sudden and sharp rise in popularity in America. For decades, it simply wasn't popular in the US. A lack of American drivers and oversaturation of other sports, a lack of tradition in the States, all compounded to keep F1, for the most part, overseas. But I just got back from the United States Grand Prix in Austin, Texas, and I can confirm F1 attendance is stronger than ever, with a huge crowd at the race. So this begs the question of why? What changed for F1? And what changed for the millions of Americans who are now loyal fans of the sport? And I'll let you know in advance, it's not just the Netflix show. Lando Norris takes the checkered flag. Max Verstappen takes the win. Charles Leclerc wins the Bahrain Grand Prix. The Monaco Grand Prix. The Italian Grand Prix. Belgian Grand Prix. The US Grand Prix is underway. Racing sports have a storied history in the United States. For decades, the American racing sport has been NASCAR. Start your engine! with stock car racing dominating American viewership, especially in the southern part of the country. IndyCar is the other American racing sport, with especially the Indy 500 drawing massive crowds and attention as the crown jewel of the IndyCar season. And those cars are going real fast and real laugh, son! And in the United States, this, for the most part, was the landscape of racing sports. Worldwide, however, Formula One dominates. The pinnacle of motorsport, with drivers racing custom-built cars at speeds of over 200 miles an hour in a battle of strategy, engineering, and speed. In 2021, over 450 million viewers worldwide tuned in to the F1 circuit. But in America, we mostly preferred NASCAR and Indy. In recent years, though, this is changing. Since 2018, Formula One has seen a dramatic rise in U.S. viewership, an estimated 106% increase, and continued relevance throughout the states. But why are Americans all of a sudden tuning in? Today, we're answering that question. Sure, you could point to the most straightforward potential answer, the popularity of Netflix's Drive to Survive, a docu-series covering the drivers and stories of Formula One. The show was a smash hit, with multiple seasons being the most watched show on Netflix for certain periods. And the popularity of the show has spurred millions of new fans across America to tune into races to see what's going on. At the Austin Grand Prix in 2022, over a third of the fans in attendance cited the show as their reason for going. However, it's not just Netflix. In 2017, F1 was acquired by the American mass media company Liberty Media. Following that acquisition, American sports jumped at F1 as a new frontier. ESPN purchased broadcast rights to stream the races live, there was a renewed focus on social media branding and connection, and the introduction of two new American Grand Prix in Miami and Las Vegas have all served to invigorate the American audience to tune in to the previously non-American sport. Anyone out there who wants to go fast, I want to go fast! But the secret sauce of what actually keeps viewers hooked, not just watching one-off races, is the drivers and their storylines. But we'll get into that later. For now, if you're new to F1 or just want a refresher, here's a breakdown of the sport. The Formula One Championship is comprised of a series of races held around the world over the course of the season. As of this year, there are 24 different races held at iconic racetracks all over the world, including Bahrain, Japan, Monaco, Italy, the UK, just to name a few. Each Grand Prix is held over three days, typically on a weekend, with a practice day, a qualifying day, and a race day. The one that really matters, as you might guess, is race day, because the driver's placement on that day determines how many points they get, with the winner getting 25 points, second place getting 18, and so on through the top 10 places, with drivers 11 through 20 getting no points. Over the course of the year, drivers are competing for the World Drivers' Championship, the trophy awarded to the driver who accumulates the most points by the end of the season. Additionally, there is another season-long trophy, the Constructors' Championship. And this is where we get into one of the most recognizable parts of F1, the teams. Constructors like McLaren, Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull fill teams of two drivers apiece, with 10 teams in total. And these teams don't just sponsor the drivers, they also have to manufacture the cars. And this is where Formula One really stands out from the rest of the sporting world. In NASCAR and IndyCar, all drivers are driving on the same base car, the next-gen car and the Dallara DW12, respectively. In F1, however, each team is tasked with designing and building their cars from the ground up. And this aspect of the competition means that F1 is basically a massive, expensive science fair. It's better thought of actually as one giant 
experiment. The world's highest end tech competition, science fair. Teams do have to follow a standard of rules for each car. For instance, width and height limits, no continuously variable transmissions, a set of safety requirements, and unsurprisingly, no more or less than four wheels, no 18 wheelers out on the F1 track. But outside of this set of rules, the formula of Formula One, it's up to the creativity and ingenuity of teams to design the best car possible, and then improve that car over the course of the season. It's an arms race where teams are always looking for that slight edge to make their cars a little bit faster than all the others. Pops, that's a Bernoulli Convergenator. Transponder, schmonder, you want real kick, you go Bernoulli. In the early days of Formula One, cars were loud and highly unsafe. They had an open cockpit with only the most courageous of drivers stepping inside. I mean, they didn't even wear helmets until the 1970s. The 70s is also when engineers began really optimizing for downforce, the aerodynamic effect that effectively pushes the car into the ground and allows it to turn sharply at high speeds. Over the years, cars have continued to improve. Turbochargers were introduced and then banned by the FIA. Carbon fiber allowed cars to be lighter and therefore faster. The halo safety feature was mandated for driver safety, and teams are now carving these intricate front and rear wings to maximize aerodynamics. And now, every F1 team is fielding a car packed full of human ingenuity. There are highly complex steering wheels that control a ton of aspects of the car. There are efficient and powerful engines capable of pushing the cars to speeds of almost 250 miles an hour. And of course, there are the ever important tires. So F1 tires must be strong enough to withstand the rapid speed and braking during a race, as well as being soft enough to grip onto the track and turn on a dime. F1 teams on race day choose between different classes of tires, with each offering a different trade-off of durability and speed. The faster a tire can go, the more often you're going to need to change them via pit stops. So as the cars and drivers are racing around the track, the teams are actively evaluating, making the call of what tire to use at different points in the race, and if they should pull over, make a pit stop and get a new set of tires. But of course, in this high-speed strategic sport, the seconds spent changing tires matter. So the strategy of when you take a pit stop is critical. It's all a game of going as fast as possible while maximizing your edge over the other drivers. But as you might guess, fielding a successful F1 car isn't just about speed, it's also about cash, and lots of it. So much so that the FIA, the governing body in charge of F1, recently instituted a cap on race car development of $135 million a year. And before this was put in place, some teams were spending nearly half a billion dollars on their cars. So you take these wildly expensive, innovative, brilliant car designs, and you put drivers in the cockpit, put cars on the track, and you have them go as fast as possible around that track. It's not surprising that people tune in at least once, but the key to F1's continued success is the drivers and their compelling storylines and rivalries. The F1 circuit is limited to only 20 drivers at a time. And because of this, each one can become a key and personal player to the sports drama. In 2024, the grid features seasoned legends like Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton, newer stars like Max Verstappen and Lando Norris, and up-and-coming drivers who could become the next big thing, like Liam Lawson and Oscar Piastri. With these coveted and competitive 20 spots, how did the drivers even get here? So most F1 drivers started very young, beginning their careers in competitive karting as young as five or six years old. If they had the talent to succeed in the karting leagues, these aspiring drivers began to work their way up the Formula Leagues. Beginning in Formula 4, drivers that win at that rank of the system can move their way up to Formula 3 and then Formula 2, hopefully concluding with a career in Formula 1. As they work their way up, the cars they're driving are getting more and more powerful. It's also a massive financial burden to take on this journey as a driver. Drivers are expected to fund their own carts and then cars, as well as their travel, race registration, etc. Moreover, it's highly physically and mentally demanding to be a top driver, requiring elite reaction speed, the ability to handle lots of g-forces, and mental toughness. But if you can get into one of those limited F1 driver spots, you enter into a world of intense rivalries and global celebrities. With the limited number of athletes, there is great potential for storylines and personal connection, and this was very well highlighted by the Netflix show. And this has resonated strongly with American audiences who tune in not just for the action, but also for the personalities behind it. As an example of this, let's look at the 2021 battle for the F1 championship between the current top driver in the sport, Max Verstappen, as well as likely the greatest racer of all time, Lewis Hamilton. Throughout the 2021 season, Hamilton was chasing his record 8th Drivers' Championship. 
and Verstappen was chasing his first title, bolstered by a Red Bull car that was designed perfectly for his aggressive driving style. For the first 21 races, the Mercedes and Red Bull drivers battled fiercely for the lead in points, trading pole positions, podiums, and even multiple crashes between the two men. And in an almost too perfect finish to the season, it all came down to the final Grand Prix, with the drivers tied exactly on points going into the last race in Abu Dhabi. As the race began, Hamilton had the best start and he took the lead. And he held this lead for most of the race, despite Verstappen challenging him many times. And then, Latifi of the Williams team crashed with five laps to go. As the safety car came in and slowed the whole race down to clear off the crash, Verstappen took the chance to make a pit stop and get a brand new set of tires. A risk that Hamilton in front of him could realistically not take. Typically with a safety car, the race continues in that slowed state until all the cars that have been lapped pass back to their original unlapped positions. But the length of the process of unlapping the cars would most likely result in the race ending with a safety car still on the track, giving Lewis and the Mercedes team the victory in a very anticlimactic way. Instead, the FIA made the hotly disputed decision to start the race back up earlier than expected, ensuring that the Grand Prix would end on one final racing lap. So, uh, there's confusion, but the safety car is coming in at the end of this lap. So they, those back markers allowed to overtake the safety car. Michael, this isn't right. Lewis Hamilton was still driving on very worn tires. And with Verstappen behind him on brand new ones, it was no surprise that the Red Bull driver was quickly able to overtake. Down the inside, Hamilton sees it coming. It's a late lunch by Verstappen, who takes the lead of the race. Verstappen now snatches the championship trophy from Lewis Hamilton, who's trying to fight back. And eventually win the race, taking home the World Drivers' Championship in very contentious fashion. The bubbles and the sparkly stuff to celebrate as a Formula One World Championship for the first time. But despite this controversial end, the 2021 Formula One season remains one of the greatest and most memorable in the sport's history, drawing in the masses with the thrilling season-long rivalry that was on display between the two athletes. So, F1 doesn't look like it's going anywhere, internationally or in the United States. Certainly, Formula One has a lot to thank Netflix's drive to survive for, but it's not only that. Formula One has more American-based races, more thrilling storylines, has teams pouring innovation and engineering into their cars, and is more accessible than ever thanks to new American ownership. And of course, F1 races will always have cars and drivers going really, really fast around a track. And that will probably never go out of style. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you like this type of video breakdown about sports, you should check out more on my channel. I recently posted one about Derek Rose, the NBA player who went from MVP to being injured for years to then having a career high game after everyone else counted him out. It's a really great story and you should go check it out. You should also subscribe to tune in for more in the future. I've got plenty more coming. I'll see you in the next one.